Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Community Church of Hudson. My name is Wes Klingeman. I'm an elder here, and I want to welcome everybody. Uh, if this is your first time online, welcome. Uh, things are a little bit different right now. We appreciate you taking the time to connect with us uh, digitally um, and looking forward to connecting with you in person, hopefully soon. Uh, we want to remind you that even though we're scattered right now, we're still here for you as a church. So if you have any questions, please reach out to one of the elders, uh, reach out to the pastor, uh, reach out to the, the, your fellow people in the congregation. Um, we also want to continue to say thank you as we hear stories of you reaching out to each other, connecting in times when it's a little bit more difficult to connect with each other, uh, using whatever means you can uh, to stay connected. Uh, we like to hear those stories. We'd also like to encourage you to continue to grow in your faith. Um, uh, utilize some of the tools that are available to you. Uh, that might mean using Right Now Media. There's some great adult resources there as well as uh, resources for our youth. Uh, if you need access to that, please contact the church secretary or the pastor and they can help you get connected there. There's also a Bible app for kids, um, just a lot of resources. So if you have questions about getting connected to any of those, please reach out and we'll help you get connected there. In addition, uh, Pastor Chip is doing a couple other digital services throughout the week. Uh, Wednesday night, he's got a uh, continued uh, Bible study, uh, continuing in the Minor Prophets, I believe. Yes, he's saying Minor Prophets. And, uh, and then on Fridays as well, there's a Q&A session. So the same way you're reaching us here this morning, uh, you can find those resources there as well. We also want to continue to thank you for your faithfulness to the church and to the Lord and giving back to the Lord through your tithes and offerings. We want to remind you that you can give online at www.ccohonline.org slash give. Or you can continue to mail your tithe to the church office, whatever way works best for you. With that, I will invite you to please uh, join me in prayer. Lord, we want to take a minute to pause uh, and give you thanks for everything you've given us, Lord. You truly are the Lord of Lords and, and the King of Kings, and, and we come before you humbly as we always do, Lord, and we want to thank you for everything you've given us. Um, uh, salvation, an opportunity to be with you in, in paradise, Lord, and, and uh, we just look forward to the time that we can spend with you there. Lord, we also want to um, continue to pray for each other. Uh, as the body of Christ, we want to pray for all the people of the world. We're, we're really dealing with some difficult times right now, Lord, and we ask for your continued blessings. Um, on ourselves, on our fellow neighbors, uh, on the doctors who are, who are uh, attending to the needs of many people in the world, Lord. We ask for continued wisdom for them and, uh, and for just um, uh, your continued blessings on everybody, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. With that, we'll transition to a time of, of uh, uh, singing and rejoicing and worship. Uh, I'll invite everybody to please uh, don't fast forward here. Uh, spend some time uh, in singing and in rejoicing. Um, these are some great songs and great times for us to express our love to the Lord. And even though it feels a little bit weird uh, standing in your living room um, or wherever you are uh, by yourself or with a small group, uh, know that the rest of the congregation is, is singing right along with you at the same time. You probably can't hear them. I'm sure you can't see them, but they're there. Uh, your congregation and the body of Christ is coming together and singing and rejoicing to the Lord, and I'll ask you to participate in that. Please join me in worship. Thank you. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah Fight! 
saved us The spotless shed His precious blood And from the sinner's crown Love flow down In Calvary's shadow Our chains are broken Death be defeated And we are free In Calvary's shadow The darkness trembles We stand and testify That we are free We take our place beneath the cross And fix our gaze upon his majesty The slain Messiah lifted up Light of the world 
by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. This is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny No power of hell, no scheme of man Can ever block me from His hand Till He returns or calls me Good morning, church. Again, thanks so much for worshiping, for joining us with Church Online. We are, uh, I think, getting a little more comfortable with this, a little more used to what this feels like and what this looks like. And before I jump into today's talk, I want to just kind of encourage us that I know for many of us, we're living in this up and down emotional uh, well, roller coaster of what's going on with the virus and the mandates from the news and from the governor and all of this. Two things I would just really quickly encourage you in and, and, and 
uh, hopefully bring you some sense of peace through this. Number one, I would encourage you to not flood yourself or your, your phones or whatever with news. I would, I would encourage you to stay up, watch it at night, keep, keep somewhat abreast. But right now there's so much information coming. I would encourage you to, to dissipate that as much as possible. Uh, because the truth is nobody really knows what's going on and we get one side story and the other side story. I would encourage you to, to diminish that noise as much as possible. Uh, spend some time in the scriptures. Allow those to be feeding your soul, not the noise from the media and, and from the news. The second thing I would encourage you with is to just settle in your heart and your mind that this is going to be a long-term reality. Uh, and I'm not saying that to be doom and gloom. I'm saying that to protect our hearts and our minds because because it is difficult to live in this hopeful, hope deferred, hopeful, hope deferred. And it's just going to keep happening. And I don't want to see us get bogged down emotionally in some of that. So my encouragement is as, as strange as this time is and as, as unusual as this time is, is to begin to think about your new weekly, what's your new weekly normal? What's your new weekly rhythm and schedule? This isn't a vacation. I think most of us spent the first couple of weeks thinking this was going to be short and, and we'd get out of this, but, but it, we are going to get out of this. But now it's kind of a normal thing. And let's slip into that and allow our hearts to realize that we need to continue to make those efforts uh, to stay connected virtually and however we can. And we need to continue to make church a priority. We need to continue to make God a priority. In fact, probably even more than we were before. Let this shake us out of our apathy and our complacency a little bit. So I just want to encourage us in that, uh, just to help settle our hearts and our minds a bit, because the more we're settled on that, the less anxious we will be. And scripture tells us that he's not given us a spirit of fear, but of sound mind and of love. And so let me encourage you in those things. But now let's jump in. I'm excited about today's talk. It'll be a, a challenge for us and also a little bit of a reminder for us as we look at the last sentence that we're going to look at. It's not the last one that Jesus spoke. We went out of order, but it's the last sentence that we're going to look at in our series, The Red Letter Day. And if you've been with us, we've, we've looked at, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then last week we looked at, it is finished. And what the beautiful message of Easter and the finished work of the cross means. But today we're going to look at the statement that Jesus makes, and I'm not going to give it away yet, but we're going to look at one more statement. The bumper gave it away. Uh, of Father, forgive them, for they know, know not what they do. But let me read the text for us. It's Luke 23, verses 32 through 35. So we're going to read this whole little portion. And it says this. It says, Two others, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. And then they came to the place that is called the skull. There they crucified him, and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. But the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The statement of Christ on the cross uh, as he is being crucified is such an amazing thought. On its own, but when we consider the wider truths that come and that are a part of this statement, it's such a powerful sentence, and it's such a... For those of us, it, as we'll see, hopefully it, by the end of this, it should be such a weight, a blanket of comfort, this warmth, comfort of God's grace on us. But it also is a challenge to us as well that we'll talk about here in a moment. But I want to first talk about some of the other words, the other statements, the other realities surrounding this one sentence that Jesus spoke. And I want to read, they crucified him. Now, we we understand this. If you've spent any time in church at all, you understand this. But crucifixion was actually a pretty common in the Roman world. Uh, they didn't invent it. They perfected it, but they didn't invent it. But it was a pretty common capital punishment form from about the 6th century to when uh, it was banned by Constantine in 337 BC. So this, this pro prolonged use of punishment was pretty common. So they crucified him. And what we see as the picture is as, as Luke starts the story, two others. So he's describing these two other people that we're familiar with. We've seen the pictures of the three crosses, and those are accurate. But Luke describes these guys a little bit differently than Matthew or Mark do. See, Matthew and Mark, they actually use words that would translate into robbers or 
uh, rebellious zealots. And so what Luke is doing, Luke, I love how Luke did this. Luke uses the word criminal and literally translated, the word is actually evildoers. And this is important because Luke is specifically using language that removes Jesus from being compared to the other two. Now, if, if you use Matthew and Mark's language, and there's nothing wrong with what they did, but if you use the language that they used, Jesus can be lumped in as a zealot. Because he's a religious, he was religious beyond where the religious were. He was, he was taking the religious standards and he elevated those standards. So he was zealous for what he was teaching. But by Luke using this word criminal or evildoer, what he is doing is he is removing Jesus from being compared to these other two. And he is saying that this man is innocent. And that's a beautiful statement that in the writing of the scriptures that Luke is beginning to even depict who he is from the choice of words that he uses. Now, look at the end of verse 35, and their statement was completely condescending. End of 35, it says, he, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen. So the, conden the condemnation, the, the uh, sarcasm is dripping from their statement here. If he really is the Christ, now remember, Christ is not Jesus' last name, it is a title. Christ means the anointed one. So when you say Jesus Christ, what you are actually saying is Jesus, the anointed one. So they're, they're condemning him. They're being sarcastic and saying, if he really is the anointed one, he saved other people, let him save himself. They didn't understand it yet. And I want us to realize something. I want us to think about something. If you've spent time in church at all, you have heard the week of these events. You have heard these things surrounded but usually, you've, you've, typically, we hear them talked about in a way that it's the crowd, that we're talking about Mary and, and uh, the disciples that are there. And usually, we're looking at those. But for a moment, I want to just take you back. Let's go all the way back to where Jesus has been betrayed. He, they hold a court. They hold a hearing in the middle of the night, which broke their own laws. Then he puts them, they put him before Pilate, and Pilate initially says he can't find anything. And then all of a sudden, they, they say they want Jesus instead of Barabbas. And so he washes his hands, thinking that's going to do any good. They then are given to soldiers, and he's beaten. These soldiers, who there is literally soldiers at this time whose one job it was, was to beat criminals was to beat and punish people who are found guilty. And so these men then take that job upon themselves and they beat Jesus' back. 39 stripes he took on his back, which Roman law was death was by 40. So he took 39 stripes on his back, shredding his back open. Then soldiers laid the purple robe on his back and pulled out his beard by, his, by the roots and kind of a funny story here, I remember one time when the gray was just showing up, now there'd be nothing left if we did this, but the gray in my beard was just literally showing up. There were like three or four. And one time I asked Krista, you know, hey, why don't you pluck those for me? Well, if you grab a whole bunch, it doesn't really hurt. But when you grab just a few and you yank, it really is not comfortable. And so she, she went to pluck and grab just a few, not the one, but just a few. And that was the end of us trying to do that. But they're, they're grabbing his beard and they're ripping it out by the roots. And then they take this crown of thorn. And, and what we have to work at is to not think about the thorns that we think of on rose plants or, or a rose stem. These, these thorns were you know, two inches or so long. They were huge. They were nail-like. And they would jam this on his head. And they didn't just set it there. They beat it down onto his head to where it pierced. So all of this is going on. And then as the blood from his back dried, they'd peel the robe off again, opening all the wounds again. And then they paraded him through the city streets, making a spectacle of him. And then they get there and they nail his hands and his feet to the cross. And they lift him up and they begin to mock. And they do all of these things. And imagine being that person. 
Imagine the hatred and the vitriol that is running through your body about this person, Jesus, who you probably don't really know. You just know what you've been told. And I know on some level there were some of them that were just doing their job and, and following orders and all of those things. But think about all of these people that it took. The attitudes and the anger and the hatred all aimed at Jesus. And we get to this moment where he is about to be hung on the cross. And Jesus says these words. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's incredible. If anybody had the right to not forgive any group of people, it would be Jesus having the right to not forgive this group of people. So it's just, it's not about this. It's not just about those people. Because here's the big thing, the big word in his statement, clearly forgive is amazing, a word, but the big word in his statement is them. Father, forgive them. Because what he is saying in that moment is that everyone involved, everyone that has participated in this moment that has brought us to today, that has culminated in the death of Jesus Christ, forgive them. Now here's the amazing part about that. If we're not careful... Well, those of us today in, in modern times, our mind runs to all of the people that I just described. But Scripture tells us in John, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that the wages of sin is death. Paul says this in Romans, that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. So the price for our sin was death. And so Jesus, heading to the cross, is paying our price. is paying our bill. And in the midst of that, he says, forgive them. I know what they are going to do. I know what they have done. I know what they're going to do. But Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. It, it's, it's almost like we don't, when we look at that sentence, it changes the magnitude of what our sin looks like. Because when we think about sin, we think about, oh, the white little lies or the great, you know, just, which by the way, there is no categorization in scripture of white lie or not. There's lies. But we categorize, well, it's not that bad. I'm better than so-and-so. I'm better than this. I don't, I don't do that, therefore. But what Jesus is saying and what Scripture repeatedly says is that all of our sin is what Jesus took on the cross. We talked about that last week. And so as he's doing so, it's not just them that he sees in the moment that are on his mind. It is us. It is you and I that a few thousand years later he knew that he would rescue. So see, but we tend to think so myopically that it's the political people and the spiritual leaders and the soldiers of the day. But theologically, we just talked about this would be wrong. See, the cross is eternal and so are its purposes and its results. Interestingly, it's, it's interesting that in Acts chapter 7, we hear very similar words echoed. Now, I want to be clear, they have a very different result, as in Jesus and Stephen in Acts chapter 7 are not the same. Stephen is by no means a deity, but his heart is understanding and his heart is in the right place. See, Stephen was an early preacher of the gospel. He was an early follower of Christ. And in fact, scripture and history records him as being the first martyr that we come in contact with, excluding Jesus. But he is the first martyr of humanity that died for his faith, died for what he was proclaiming. And in Acts chapter 7, verse uh, 60, he says, and this is at the end of his stoning, they drug him out into the middle of the, or outside of the city, and they threw rocks at his head, basically. That's what stoning is. If you read that in the Bible, it's, some would do it differently. Sometimes, we don't see that in this case, but sometimes they would literally just bury the person up to their neck. So where all you saw was the head, and they just throw rocks at it till it, killed them 
Stephen, we don't see that. Stephen, we, we get the picture that he was upright or, or just exposed and they just kept pelting him with rocks. But here's what he says in verse 60. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Again, Stephen proclaiming the gospel of Jesus and all of these people are throwing rocks at him. And, and it's interesting if you read that story, the rest of that story, or, or if you read the whole story, there's actually a small sentence in there that says there was a young man named Saul who was giving his approval to this. And Saul turns out to be Paul who wrote most of the New Testament. So Saul was there giving his approval to this. So you've got people giving their approval. You've got people participating. And Stephen echoes the words of Jesus. Forgive them for they don't, they don't really know what they're doing. Hebrews 10.10 10 says this and says, And by that we, will have, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And this gets us to the meat of today for just a few more minutes. Is what, is, what does this mean for us? What does this statement on the cross mean for us? And I talked about the sacrifice last week. But Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, just reminded us that this was once for all. So this was, this was a forgiving of sins. When we acknowledge our need of a Savior and we ask Jesus to forgive us, we are forgiven, period. But what tends to happen is we tend to get in our own heads or we allow the enemy to get in our own heads and we begin to hear, well, you're forgiven except for this thing over there. Well, you're forgiven, but nobody could forgive what you did here. And we continue to play those over in our heads and our minds and what we think is that all of our sins are forgiven. All of our sins can possibly be forgiven except for. That it's not possible. That, so we live in this reality. Well, actually, let me, let me rephrase. We live in this make-believe world that our sins can't be forgiven, that our realities can't be forgiven. But Jesus has forgiven us once for all. So our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven. So if you are a follower of Christ today, you do not hold yourself. You do not need to consider anything in condemnation because Jesus said in him there is no condemnation. So we've been forgiven once and for all. But here's the other thing the cross does. Here's the other thing that this statement shows us. Is that you and I have the ability to forgive. See, elsewhere in Scripture, Jesus tells a story of a, rich, of a rich man who had a young man who had debt against him. And he, he went, he had debt also, and this man went and he had debt against him. So he went to the master, the person that he owed the money to, and asked for forgiveness and was shown forgiveness of that debt. And then another man who comes along who owes the man who was forgiven money comes and asks for the same act of forgiveness to be given to him, and this man shows him none. It's similar how we interact with other people. It's similar in sometimes how we treat people. And here's what the challenge of the cross has to meet our everyday lives. That if you and I have received, acknowledged, and walk in the forgiveness of Christ, and if we are made to glorify him and we are made to reflect him, then we have to offer that same forgiveness. Well, I can't possibly do that. Really? Has anyone drug you through the city carrying a heavy cross after your back was beaten, your beard pulled out? Has anyone drug you outside of a city and tried to stone you? Jesus and even Stephen give us the example of what it means to forgive. Here's a, here's a portion of scripture that we love to quote, and it's appropriate to quote. But have you ever thought about the words? Luke 11:4. Almost, once I start, almost every one of you will know this. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. So when Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, he even teaches this. That, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive us of our sins so that we in turn can forgive those who sin against us. Now, a lot of people have said a, a similar statement, but I came across this quote 
that was attributed to, uh, to Nelson Mandela. And here's what he says. He says, not forgiving someone is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. You see, Jesus and Stephen, I know Jesus, we can't compare to Jesus. No, you're right, we don't. But Stephen was just a human, was just a man. You're like you and I living his life, trying to be uh, obedient to God and open his mouth when God told him to. And yet in the midst of hatred, in the midst of people coming against him, in the midst of people hurting him, he was able to say, forgive them. And just like Mandela talks about that, if we hold on to unforgiveness, all we're doing is building up bitterness in our own hearts and in our own lives. And when we're doing that, we're expecting that to hurt the other person. But it doesn't. It hurts us. And so one of the lessons from the cross that we learn from Jesus as he's about to be hung and he's about to die is that he asked for the Father to forgive them. And see, here's the truth of the matter. We're supposed to offer forgiveness. It's up to the other person how they act within that forgiveness. They may still continue to hurt. That's not on you. Your heart is to forgive. And you've got to give that to Jesus. You've got to lay that at the foot of the cross. That's what it's there for. Is that if you've been hurt, if you've been misused, if you, whatever it is, and I know that there are stories of horrible, atrocious things that have happened. And in all sincerity, I'm sorry. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the work of Jesus in our lives, we are able to forgive. Is it easy? No. Is it necessary? Absolutely. So I want to encourage us, I want to challenge us this week to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and work in our lives. Where are those areas of people that we haven't forgiven? And I would encourage us to think about writing a note or picking up the phone or shooting an email. And to just admit that we've held bitterness, that we've held hurt against them, and to move forward and allow the Holy Spirit to heal. Because Jesus teaches us on the cross that not only is our, his forgiveness for us once and for all, but that same forgiveness that's available for us is available to others through us. That we can offer forgiveness to others because much forgiveness has been given to us. And if we think of our own sin in the right perspective and the magnitude of which took Jesus to the cross, if we understand that about ourselves, then we can begin to look at other people and the offenses that other people have done to us seem so much smaller. Let me pray for us this morning. Lord, we give you praise. We give you honor that, Lord, that on your cross, you showed us how to forgive. Lord, that in your teaching of your disciples and how to pray, you, you instructed us to forgive. Lord, that you didn't do so just out of empty gesture, but that you showed us what it means to forgive. That everybody involved in your crucifixion, from those there to those coming, you offered your forgiveness to and continue to offer your forgiveness. So with head bowed and eyes still closed, if you're there watching this morning and you don't know Jesus, I want to encourage you that that forgiveness is available to you today. Because maybe you've always thought in yourself, well, I'm a good person. I don't do this. I don't do that. That's not how it's measured, my friend. It's measured as, have you fallen short of what God's plan for your life is? Have you sinned against him and fallen short? Have you fallen short of his measure? And my friend, the answer is yes, because we all have. And this morning, I want to encourage you right where you're at to just simply say a prayer, asking the Lord to forgive you of your sin and to come and be Lord of your life. Paul talks elsewhere in the book of Romans. He says, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that you can be saved. And so before I close, I want to say a prayer and I'm going to ask you to repeat it after me. And then just let us know afterwards so we can engage with you. Click that button at the bottom. Let us know that you made a decision to follow Christ this morning. Repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. 
and that you came to die to forgive me. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Come be Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And for the others of us, let me pray over us that we'll be able to act in forgiveness. Lord, help us to forgive where you have shown us forgiveness. Help us to show others forgiveness. Lord, help us to be obedient to you today and to walk as an example of your grace to other people. We give you praise and we give you honor in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you, church. Please reach out. Let us know any prayer requests, anything we can do. We're praying for you. We're here for you. If you have any, uh, anything, we're, we're available at the church. Please reach out to us. But we love you. God bless you. We'll see you here for church next Sunday morning. Have a great week.